Starting, all attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning. Uh, thank you very much to our audience today for registering and for uh, joining the first uh, launch webinar. Uh, so launch is an H2020 funded project uh, that kicked off in May 2018. And as you can see from the title, we are looking at large scale aggregation of sustainable energy assets. So just to get started and a few housekeeping items before we begin, uh, you have a question and answer box in your GoToWebinar panel. So please feel free, you can uh, write in at any time with your questions during the presentation. Uh, during the presentations, we will not answer them right away, but we will have a dedicated Q&A session at the very end of the presentation. So we're aiming to have a good, um, at least 10 to 15 minutes for, uh, for questions. Uh, so today, uh, myself, my name is Caroline Milne. I am a Communications and Marketing Director from Jewel Assets Europe. Uh, I am replacing our Managing Director, Jessica Strombach, today uh, as she's unfortunately unable to attend. Uh, so I will be kicking us off with a general presentation of launch, presenting the partners and the general context and, um, and uh, the general context of the, of the overall uh, program. Uh, then we will have John O'Rourke, CEO of New Energy Group, giving a presentation from his side. And New Energy Group is an energy service company based in Ireland. Uh, following John, we will have Quentin Rinx, uh, who is from BNP Paribas, and he's a senior advisor of clean tech. Uh, following Quentin, we'll have Chaba Chi, who is chairman of Enersave Capital, and Matthew Halstead from TNO, a research institution based in the Netherlands, uh, will be uh, wrapping up the presentations, then followed again by the Q&A. So I took a look at the registration list and I saw that many of your names are already familiar. And I'm sure that many of you uh, listening in today uh, have, may have some familiarity with the CIF H2020 project, uh, the Sustainable Energy Asset Framework and the eQuad platform, which came out of that project, uh, which is now managed by Jewel Assets. And this project really looked to create a matchmaking tool, hence the eQuad online platform, between contractors and investors. And the platform itself provides um, financial, standardized financial pro formas for investors. Uh, it connects project developers to uh, uh, performance insurance for their projects in energy efficiency in general and just for any project and sustainable energy assets. Uh, and then it also can connect project developers to certification from uh, the investor confidence project. Now, the idea behind the CIF project was really to uh, close the language gap and the communication gap between uh, contractors for projects and project investors. And it was especially uh, developed in the context of the EU 2030 targets of all of our end climate targets, essentially. Um, and the fact that as this study that I'm pointing to from the European Commission from a couple of years ago, it mentions that uh, we need to mobilize 177 billion euros from public and private investment sources annually from 21, 2021 to 2030 to reach our targets. So it's an enormous sum of money and CIF and the eQuad platform were really developed in view of bridging this gap and enabling more finance that is already in existence now to be deployed towards projects. Uh, so when we are applying for launch, this was really, this kind of led us to apply for launch, in fact. The, and when we were submitting our project proposal last year in September 2018, this just gives you a little look at the kind of numbers and 
the volume of projects that we were dealing with on the eQuad platform and that we are processing towards investment. So as you can see, we had 45 active projects from a total of four different sectors. Uh, the project pipeline was quite large, um, over 164 million euros. Uh, the IRR range was very good. The payback time was also very attractive. Um, average payback time is you know, very attractive for most project investors. So in theory, this was great. Um, I should just give you, there's one caveat. Uh, there were a few exceptionally large projects on the pipe on our platform, which kind of warps the number a little bit of our total project pipeline at this time. The majority of projects were well below 1 million euros each. Uh, and while, and the, I would also say that a lot of the projects that we are dealing with were coming from SME uh, contractors or project developers um, who are also working with smaller SME clients. And what we found during this time was that um, the pro many of the projects were great and had everything that investors would want. But there were still key issues that our platform wasn't able to solve. And that is that deal closure was still too long. Um, presenting a project in a certain way towards investors uh, is a tremendous help towards bridging this gap. But it doesn't solve the issue that for most, the majority of project developers that we were dealing with, their average sales process was uh, around 18 months, you know, at best. Uh, they also were facing lack of standardized contracts, which led to uncertainty when dealing with project financiers and also having a lack of access to growth capital, uh, you know, compounded the issues because within the field that we're all working today, aggregation is the name of the game. We're all aware that most projects are small. But aggregating projects and developing the pipelines that investors require is very challenging when you don't have the, the bandwidth literally within your own team to, to, to get that work done. It's an enormous amount of work to sell, to shorten your sales process. So th these are things that we identified with contractors as real uh, continuous barriers to market growth that aren't going away. At the same time, uh, EQUAD could not solve the fact that um, the majority of projects and por project portfolios currently being in are too small. Uh, the average project and fund is at the very best looking at you know, wanting to invest one to two million, but most are at a minimum of five million or more. And again, for the project developers, given their slow um, customer acquisition cycle, this is a real challenge. It's a real challenge to meet these needs. And again, due diligence costs are, are quite high for on the investor side. This, this just isn't going away. So the vision of the launch project is ultimately thinking larger than just aggregating a few projects into one portfolio. We thought in order to make this market really grow, in order to solve these issues, we need to tackle both sides of the story. We need to look at the contracts. We need to look at risk assessment portfolios that investors are using. And we need to look at how we can better support contractors to develop their pipelines. And that means how they can also access growth capital, for example. We believe that these elements can eventually lead to a securitizable market. And we believe that in the context of the EU goals and with all of the, um, with, I, I mean, in, I, I live in Brussels myself and in the Brussels bubble, aggregation is constantly the focus. And indeed, it is also a focus of the European Commission. So we need to think larger. We need to think about how we can securitize at a much larger scale. And what are the elements that are needed to really build this market? And only then can we aggregate. So today, the consortium uh, will be speaking more to the work that they're doing specifically with the focus on um, the standardized energy performance contract which we are currently uh, working on, as well as uh, sales processes for contractors. 
Uh, so the consortium can includes Joule Assets, again, as we are the project coordinator. Uh, we have Enersave Capital, New Energy Group, BMP Fortis, and uh, TNO. The budget for this project is 1.4 million, and the duration is 30 months. And I should tell you that um, we're looking to pilot the market tools with uh, anyone and everyone who is a real stakeholder in this market who is looking to build their pipeline, who is looking to scale, who is looking for better ways to aggregate, um, and who is looking, especially contractors, who are looking to expand and build their own companies. So uh, Matthew uh, from TNO will especially be speaking more about the piloting as this is TNO's role. Uh, however, uh, just to say, I encourage all of you in the audience to keep this in mind as you're listening to the presentations. Um, I'll mention this again at the end of the webinar, but uh, I have to say that we registration is now open for our first, um, you know, larger scale event. We'll be having a contractor workshop in the morning, specifically just for contractors, and then uh, obviously, and then uh, in the afternoon we'll have a high level conference that will include uh, key experts uh, in finance and in energy and sustainable energy assets who will also be discussing more how we can better scale and how EPC particularly, um, whether it really provides uh, users the competitive edge required to move this entire market forward. And with that, I would also let you know that there will be pitching sessions for contractors before uh, panels of equity and project financiers. So if you have projects or if you are looking to do an equity raise within your company, I would encourage you to get in touch following the webinar because we are um, actively looking now for uh, serious companies who would like to pitch at this event and to have obviously the exposure to, uh, to investors. Uh, so thank you very much. I hope this was a useful introduction and I will hand over the floor now to John uh, O'Rourke, who will be uh, specifically presenting on the work that they are doing, uh, developing a sales process for, uh, for contractors. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone, and uh, welcome to the first, I guess, of a series of, of plan launch webinars and workshops, uh, which we hope that all of you will engage in uh, in the launch project uh, going forward. My name is John O'Rourke. Uh, my company is NEG, and we are an energy contractor and project developer operating out of uh, Dublin, Ireland. At one of our first meetings when we kicked off launch, uh, I remember being asked, I believe, by Chaba from Enersafe Capital at the time, you know, who will be, as a project developer, what do you need to make this project development move at a faster pace while also improving customer adoption rates? And my answer was immediate. I said, Chaba, we need a true and indisputable off-balance sheet transaction for my customers. We need a contract mechanism that doesn't need a translator or interpreter every time. And we need easy access to project finance in order to fund the opportunities, and if successful, investment capital in my company to fund the sales, marketing, and technical support need to fuel the growth. In return, though, I need to demonstrate to my partners that I not only possess the ability to manage content, and that's the technical assets of the company, or the internal, which are the processes that we use to manage our business, but I also have to demonstrate that I can manage the external, which is the process that we use to engage in customer activity. It is this activity that we refer to as the sales process. Okay, just bear with me. I have a little glitch on moving a slide here. Uh, 
Uh, there we go. So why is the sales process so important? Well, first and foremost, the largest risk a project developer faces is dry hole risk. Much the same as oil developers, we who are engaged in this business just cannot afford to be drilling for opportunity with no results. Given the cost of developing projects, it's just not feasible to be running around drumming up customers at will and marshalling, marshalling technical, financial, and legal support resources without having a systematic sales process that organizes the manner and the sequence in which we engage without understanding fully what is the customer decision that we are trying to affect. In fact, failure to follow an organized approach to business development without understanding our customer's decision-making process will result in a higher than anticipated dry hole scenario, resulting in unnecessary expenditure of internal costs, but more importantly, the stranded costs or that opportunity cost of those same resources. Having a standardized contract with all the relevant terms and conditions, a financial solution that is easy to understand and provides a clear competitive advantage than doing it themselves or pushing out to another budget cycle will be a game changer for project developers in the future. But regardless, if you're not presenting the legal and financial costs, benefits to the right folks at the right time, this will in most cases be for naught. From a financier's perspective, who in the future will be funding or more importantly providing growth equity to successful developers, having a disciplined contractor sales process provides for early opportunity transparency, early financial and legal engagement, but more importantly, early risk assessment that will support the contractor early on in the development cycle, not wasting people's time, not wasting people's money. In summary, this results in a better qualified pipeline with clear and rational risk mitigation strategies that ultimately make for an attractive origination organization that, that can attract the required capital and equity in their business um, and ultimately the pool of energy assets that can be securitized. So what does an effective sales process involve? We use a customer decision mapping process uh, initially before we ever target an, an opportunity. And, and basically, the, the mapping flowchart goes like this. So who is the customer? What is the decision? What's the scope of the decision within the customer's organization? And what factors are involved? The, the factors which influence decisions, decisions typically are sales volume, which is expressed in economic units, product mix, which is the demographics of volume, assessed in terms of products, elements, or brands, or categories, the strategic value, and by this we mean a measure of the implication of success or failure of affecting a given decision. You need to assess need, which is you know, your assessment of the strength of the customer's perceived need for your product or service. Funding, obviously, which is the customer's process by which funds are allocated. The availability of funds, or in some cases, the unavailability of funds. Product fit how well your product satisfies the customer requirements, the customer relationship, which is a degree to which we have established rapport, credibility, and trust, all needs to be measured early on in the sales cycle. And obviously competition, which is made up of alternatives where the customer can select, sometimes referred to as functional substitutes. So what does an effective sales process involve? Um, we call what you're looking at here, it's a decision grid. And if you have a, a research stage, a concept stage, a structuring uh, stage, a decision stage, implementation stage, and evaluation stage across the top. And on the left, we've got the three actors that are typically in every organization that you deal with. Uh, one is the owner, two is an evaluator, and three is an implementer. An owner 
is an owner, it's a CEO, or it's a uh, vice president of a division. An evaluator is typically, typically a financial analyst, it, it could a financial analyst, uh, analyst, a CFO, or maybe it's a chief engineer. And your implementer, you know, these are the folks that you will be working on the ground with, um, but, um, like a facilities manager, an engineering manager, production line manager, etc. So where you enter in your decision making in your sales process um, is incredibly important. But I think it's also very important to understand that your if you talk with your CEO, that CEO is basically going to authorize the go-ahead and the direct the decision. The evaluator will be the evaluators will be the folks that will assess what you're saying, explore it, and define it for the CEO, who will then authorize the decision. It'll go back to that evaluator to validate. At that point, he'll engage the implementer level, and then that implementer level, you will demonstrate, that's the guy that's gonna want you to demonstrate your wares, and he will make a recommendation back to the evaluator, who ultimately will inform the CEO or the decision maker to direct. So where you are in the sales process or within the decision grid is the first thing that you need to realize when out looking to sell a, a product or service that includes legal, as in contracts, and financing, as well as engineering. This is just a, just a, a, a teaser, uh, uh, folks, uh, about uh, to give you an overview of what the, what the process looks like. And we very much hope we very much hope that in November uh, that um, that a lot of contractors will sign up and ultimately we'll be able to take a couple of real life situations and work them through the process. Um, the goal is to develop a, develop a standardized sales process with a lot of input uh, from uh, project developers or people who are going to engage with launch. Um, we want to put a first draft of the sales process guide out there on November 27th, but we see, uh, we see that being a working session. And with a goal towards the end of December to be able to put out a sales process guide to help developers uh, with their end, end clients. Of course, if, if folks want to do sales process training uh, in detail across their organizations, uh, that would be uh, upon request. And, uh, with that, I, I will sign off and uh, thank you very much and hand it over to our next speaker. Hello. Uh, I am Quentin Rings from BNP Paribas Forties. Uh, the goal of this uh, presentation here is a bit to explain what is the view of a bank active in Belgium about the efficient energy market. Uh, I am part of a team which goal is to support and structure energy performance and energy renewable energy project in Belgium. So first, um, Yeah, sure. Some okay. Uh, first, uh, I will check a bit about the market assessment. Then, how we uh, assess the bottlenecks of this market, uh, what, which solution we we think is possible, and, and why we we try to launch. First of all, in Belgium, uh, we we have uh, made the made the assessment that uh, we see too few uh, inefficient energy projects. Uh, we see we we see a lot of renewable energy projects in Belgium and finance a lot of them. But considering the the challenge and the importance and efficient energy projects, we really saw that there, there was a gap in, in, in that this market was not dynamic enough. That's why we, we began to, to check with all the ESCOs in Belgium in order to see, okay, what, what are the bottlenecks? What, what, which bottleneck did you identify? John F. spoken about some of them. Uh, first of all, they said, okay, uh, the problem is clients doesn't want to invest in something which is not their cost business. They have other priorities uh, and 
this kind of investment is not really tangible. Renewable energy, you have emitters, we, which uh, which uh, which is so, and uh, and then you can't do something. Uh, for for the other part, you have the financial structuration and the financial limitation of the companies, which are saying, okay, but uh, I have to have a, a return on investment of three years in order to to finance, of to to perform a new project, and that limits a lot uh, in efficient energy projects. And third, uh, there, there are companies who are saying, okay, we want a balanced solutions. The possible solution about that were, okay, as we know the energy performance contract but we also saw some flaws in this kind of approach because uh, in the classical uh, solution of energy performance contracts it is too much to ask to an escos we ask the escos to to perform the due diligence to do the works to to guarantee the technical performance to provide financing to guarantee the financing it's too much for one company even if some ESCO are able to, to support a bit of that it's not sustainable in the long run and so it was my point was okay what, what can we do as bank in order to support the market uh, and then that's why we, we, we wanted to, 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 to be part of, of the launch because we think that one of the solution for these finance problems in, in the broad sense because here it's not a problem of bank financing it's more a problem of market and how do what 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 needs is market in order to be developed is to and and, and if we think that the collaboration of which launch offered could, could help to 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 provide some of the solutions the solution in order to, to as john said to to provide enough balance financing first of all to manage and understand the risk in energy performance project we have in the point of view of the point of view of a bank two risks a corporate risks a corporate risk and a, a project finance risk and th those two risks are really different project finance risk we, we we look at the future cash flows and the risk of the project corporate risk we look at the historical data of a company and, and these two approach are, are quite seldom mixed and that's why why we really have to better structure, better standardize the way we look at the risk of this kind of project. Finally, as we said, efficient energy projects are smaller projects. And then if in order to be able to do a portfolio of assessment, we have to tend to a standardization of the tools, the contracts, the way we look at this collaboration. And that's all these aspects, it needs collaboration. Uh, one actor cannot do that, do that for by itself because one actor doesn't have all the answers nor doesn't have to all the expertise and that's why we think that the launch project could really help the market in order to achieve that and i will leave the floor to the next speaker thanks Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm Chaba from NSAFE Capital. We are a securitization vehicle based in Luxembourg. And we are open for business to help practitioners refinance uh, their energy saving contracts. And now, as uh, my previous speakers have, have very aptly mentioned, the key for for being able to securitize is a standardized contract. First of all, having heard that we need 177 billions every year to do energy saving measures, that sounds a lot, but actually, as we will see in the future, it is not. So green themed assets are in demand, so anybody engaged in this field is in the right place. The issues are that actually investors are looking for size. And in a typical investor will want to have a bond of 50 to 100 million. He would like to know that there's uniform collateral behind it. That means similar measures financed by an identical contract. 
let's take car parks. There are 10,000 car parks throughout Europe. If all of these car parks are retrofitting their lighting with a standardized contract, suddenly you've got volume. Lastly, the EU Commission, with its organizations, is very keen on restarting the securitization market in Europe, and the EIB is standing ready to help uh, practitioners. I would like to jump back in history. If we look at what kick-started the car parking industry, we very quickly see that it was actually General Motors Acceptance Corp, which was set up uh, in 1919, that developed a standardized contract so that the purchase of a car which in today's money is around thirty to fifty thousand dollars or euros could be financed. But this parallel is very close to what's happening in the ESCO market. Just to to show you how deep this market is, in the end of seventeen, one point two trillion of bonds backed by car loans have been outstanding in the US alone. Now, if you go back to energy saving measures, actually they are less risky than a car loan because the repayment in general is covered from the energy. This makes this asset class A, attractive and B, very easy to fund. Now, how do we get to scale? If we, if, we, if we would go just to 50 million as a minimum bond, we would need around 1,700 individual contract, which clearly sounds as a lot. But if we divide that by 50 ESCOs who are doing the same thing, and I'm going to come back to my car parking model, if via Europe, various practitioners would change lighting in car parks, then it, suddenly it is a few transactions a month per practitioner. So the central piece for the French, the English, the Irish, uh, the Austrian, the German practitioner is to use the identical contract because this, in the end, helps us on the securitization front to be able to reduce the cost of due diligence, which is a mandatory step in the securitization process. So identical contracts supported by a similar or identical credit assessment creates a fast process to run, run through the securitization. Just as a quick uh, snapshot, what happens in securitization? A given practitioner who is, impl who is uh, promoting measures has got assets. He's having a client, uh, he's having a client relationship, uh, coming back to my car park, with a car park where he has changed his lights. He sells receivables, which he will receive over a given period, to a so-called special purpose vehicle, which is a securitization company uh, as, as we have it here in Luxembourg. Within this company, there is a special compartment, which then gets the assets, and is entitled to the cash flows. Backed by these receivables, and simply said, we, we put a legal string around a series of contracts. These back a bond, and the bond is subscribed by final investors. Uh, clearly, it is not as simple as that, but these are the, 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 the big steps. Every investor, who is out there, who is interested in this arena, knows how this process works. 
Luxembourg as an issuing place is very well received and of high reputation. Uh, we are having all the service providers, everything here. So it is a product which today is in high demand. What are the benefits to the practitioner or, or, or to the ESCO? Receivables are removed from his balance sheet as well as the credit exposure to that given client. This, this is resolving a great headache. The securitization vehicle in itself is a tax efficient structure. Therefore, it makes it more profitable for the practitioner to dispose of his assets. The, uh, the practitioner knows that by disposing his assets, he will be able to carry on his core business as he knows that whatever he undertakes, he's having an outlet. And as every company and every bank, there are credit limits. By removing the receivables from the practitioner's balance sheet, he's deleveraging, therefore he can take on new business. And, security, and the securitization process, you need to look at it like a conveyor belt. Whenever there are new assets coming, one creates a new bond and one is able to sell it to investors. All of this clearly needs to be supported, as my earlier speaker said, by standardization on the legal documentation and on process. With that, suddenly we can open the market to, to what is needed scale, because in order to do this, we really need to raise 177 billion a year by secu securitizing and by having standardized contracts we are making a big leap uh, ahead and this is why we believe that the launch project is essential in this in this whole process and should you have any further questions we are here as i said in the beginning we are open for business and with this i would like to thank you for your attention and hand over to the next speaker Thank you, Jabba, for that very insightful presentation. Um, I am Matthew Halstead from TNO, which is the Applied Scientific Research Center of the Netherlands. Um, I'll just take a few minutes to highlight how project developers and investors can actively engage with the launch project. One of our core objectives in launch is to actively involve stakeholders in the development of the project's materials so that these materials are ready for use in the sustainable energy asset marketplace. Uh, we don't want to develop these tools and processes in isolation uh, and need your input to achieve the success in aggregating and scaling up the market for sustainable energy assets. Uh, launch will develop four key outputs as my colleagues have already talked about earlier in this webinar. Uh, first, standardized energy performance contracts which will address the key challenges of allowing off-balance sheet financing for the end customer and enabling securitization of assets by investors. A draft is currently being finalized and will, will be ready uh, by the end of this month. Secondly, uh, a risk assessment protocol for both asset developers and their end clients, which can enable banks and investors to systematically assess risk and thus enable them to increase the flow of capital to the market. Third, sales process material to help contractors better understand their cl end client decision making process when working towards closing a contract. Uh, and John has already provided some, some very useful context here in his earlier presentation. Fourth and finally, material to help contractors gain much needed access to growth capital from private equity companies. And you can, as contractors or investors, play a key role in the development of some or all of these materials during the launch pilot program and take advantage of becoming early adopters of these outputs that will help to drive market growth. How can you do this? 
first of all, you can sign up to the launch community to receive updates about our progress and on upcoming events, such as the Contractors Workshop and Investors Forum that we'll be, we will be running later this year at BNP Paribas in Brussels on the 27th of November. Second, you can play an active role in the development of the launch material by providing feedback on the materials uh, in advance of these being piloted with live projects and in real world situations. And finally, ideally, you will have projects or cases or situations in which you can apply these materials, identify challenges with their application, and provide feedback to help inform the further development of the materials by the launch team. The pilot will be a dynamic process. Uh, you can join as and when the timing works for you. For example, as a contractor, if and when you have a client whom you feel you might need to better understand how they make decisions, such as who are the key decision makers, what roles do they play, and at what stage in their decision making process are they. Um, or as an investor who wishes to uh, perhaps explore a new market opportunity or better understand the risk of investing in uh, sustainable energy assets. We'll first identify suitable projects uh, and cases uh, by speaking bilaterally to contractors and investors, then share the draft launch materials with, with these for review. Uh, the feedback will be collected and fed back to the responsible parties in the launch project to inform the further development of the materials. And the main objective here is of taking this iterative approach is really to ensure the continuous improvement of the launch material throughout the project and to make sure critically that the tools and processes that, processes that are developed are applicable in real world market conditions. The testing will begin uh, in September and October, so uh, imminently, uh, and launch project partners have already undertaken some testing internally to the project uh, and we invite you to take the opportunity to benefit from becoming some of the first contractors and investors to make use of the material. So, as a contractor or investor, joining the launch community can be very beneficial for your company. You'll receive material that can help grow your business or open up new investment opportunities. You'll also be supporting the growth of the market by providing input to materials to make them market ready and by sharing your experiences with the launch community. And also you can connect with peers to, to share knowledge and address challenges together, as well as matching your investment interests. So I would encourage you to share your contact information with either Caroline from Dual Assets or myself after this webinar to find out more about how you can benefit from engaging with launch and importantly about the pilot program itself. And you can see our contact details at the bottom of this, uh, this slide. Uh, thanks for listening. And I'll now hand back over to Caroline to introduce the question and answer session. Thank you, Matthew, for that presentation. Thank you to all presenters, in fact, because I found even for myself that these were uh, just it's the first being the first launch webinar i have to say that this is the first time we've also seen all of our work so smoothly pulled together and i'm very impressed with this team uh and i'm very impressed with uh the way that everyone is managing to communicate what is also um a very ambitious uh so thank you for to all uh we do have a few questions from the audience um the first one is for john uh, so there, it's actually twofold. So first of all, uh, for a project developer, why can you give any more insights on why a structured sales process is so key to contract development? And uh, what are the risks it mitigates for project developers and investors? Uh, hi, good. Hi, Caroline. Um, sure. Um, well, I think as, as I had stated earlier, um, if you look at a typical uh, uh, proposal development process for a project developer, 
Um, the origination, you have, let me step back. You've got, when, when, when trying to execute a contract as a project developer, you've got four phases um, of engagement with the customer. You've got your origination process, uh, you have your development process, you've got your implementation process, and then you've got your performance period. The origination process is gets you to the point where you're generating a letter of intent with that customer. But in order to get there, you've got a lot of groundwork to do, uh, specifically in the from an engineering standpoint, uh, from a contract negotiation standpoint, in developing a term sheet, in flushing out all of the accounting issues to make sure that it is an off-balance sheet transaction and that you have early buy-in, um, and that eventually that you've got a term sheet and a contract uh, that is agreed to by all of those folks that I had spoken to earlier about the evaluators, uh, the implementers, and, 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 and ultimately the owner signing off. Um, if you don't have a structured sales process, as you are going through what is a very iterative process, projects tend to stop, uh, they get delayed, they push into another budget cycle, and ultimately, you, will, you have an 18-month sales cycle, which, which is not foreign to most ESCOs or project developers that are out there, which crosses over financial reporting uh, um, um, uh, timeframes, which makes it very difficult uh, uh, from a, a balance sheet standpoint and from an income statement standpoint for project developers to be able to represent to funders, investors, banks, that they really have a live pipeline and that, that they are investable. And um, in fact, actually, Caroline could ask you to, what was the, uh, the second part of that question, if you don't mind? Sure, of course. So the second part was, what are the risks uh, the sales process mitigates for project developers and for investors? Well, it's, it strengthens out the, uh, if, if you go through a, 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 um, a, during the origination process, if you're flushing out um, all of the uh, tangible things that you need to do in order to get to generate that letter of intent very early on in the process, you are able to, uh, you will identify the risks uh, um, in the deal and be able to communicate with the other parties that are part of the deal uh, in order to discuss them, uh, mitigate them, price them, uh, explore the value uh, of the, 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 the risk mitigation with the different parties. And ultimately, it's to shorten that sales cycle uh, while eliminating dry holes from your project pipeline. Thank you, John. Uh, that was very well said. Uh, I have a couple other questions which I will try to answer because I think they're just they're quite important and if any of you um, in the consortium want to jump in feel free so uh, first is uh, can you clarify the scope of a pro of the project in terms of what are the markets so countries and sectors in which we, we are focused and what technologies measures services are covered uh, and then there's a similar question is there a minimum size requirement or any other key requirements for participating with a pilot project. Uh, so Matthew, please jump in. My short answer to these questions, however, is um, first of all, in terms of markets and countries, we're looking at any EU country um, and all generally all sectors. Uh, so it's quite broad. Uh, we're looking specifically at the contracts that we're developing are, the standardized contracts are, energy performance contracts and energy as a service. And I believe the templates for these are um, have a lot of similarities. And in terms of technologies, measures, services covered, well, services, obviously, we're looking at supporting um, performance-based and service-based business models. And technologies and measures, uh, really anything under the umbrella of sustainable energy assets. So the terminology can be a bit fuzzy sometimes. People say energy efficiency. Um, what 
what, what energy efficiency means to one contractor might mean something different to another. It might mean just lighting for one. It might mean deep retrofit for another. Uh, really, the aim is to support the growth of of all building retrofits and all all retrofit energy retrofit in general. So um, that it, it's indeed a, a heavy lift. Um, in in terms of the minimum size requirement or any key requirements in participating. Uh, so first of all, we have, as you notice, different modules. So there's the contract, um, there's a risk assessment um, protocols, there are, there's the sales process, and there's the piece with regarding equity, accessing equity investment. Um, it really depends on you as a contractor, what your needs are and where you are in the process. So for example, we're very happy to share the documents uh, that we're developing with all of you and to get your feedback first and foremost. Um, feedback is one stage and everything that we're developing is, as Matthew said, it's 100%, um, you know, it's meant to be open source. So feedback in the development phase is essential, and that's a first step of piloting, if you will. The actual testing it and using it really depends on the project pipeline that you have, your, uh, your, um, your own requirements as a company. Obviously, you can't pilot the equity raise piece if that's not what you're looking to do, if you're not prepared for it. Um, if you are looking to uh, sell a new contract if you need a contract that is more robust for your clients that you know can get investment from project financiers that's developed with that in mind then we would encourage you if you have a pipeline to use this contract and um, Matthew especially TNO would be working very closely with you in terms of seeing what's working and what's not working and now we have to stress that within launch I would say that what we're doing is essentially we can provide support with um, it, it's it's almost you know a full throttle business support for escos in a way um and you can do every everything or just one thing it's really what you're able to bring to the table so in terms of assessing it's very much on a case by case basis um the next question is um for the our financier uh, partners. So it's regularly said that financing is one of the major bottlenecks in investing in efficient energy investments. Um, what is your analysis on this? What is your view? Uh, so Quentin or Chaba, please feel free to take the floor here. Yes, uh, I will maybe uh, begin and then Chanda will could, uh, could uh, go further in the explanation. Uh, in the market in Belgium, but indeed it's maybe specific, we don't see any problem in the bank financing. Uh, so the banks are quite willing to, to lend to corporates, to public authorities. Uh, but there is a problem in the financing in the broad sense of the exception. There is a problem in the way corporates uh, sets their financing targets to invest in projects. There is a problem in the constraint in uh, the public sector to, to so that they could invest without uh, any problems with the Eurostat rules and the, the fact that they have to be in the equilibrium. Uh, these are financial constraints, but not necessarily coming from, from bank constraints. Uh, and I think that with uh, indeed uh, standardization, possibility to create portfolios of projects, uh, possibilities to, to structure this project, we could help to to to, to pass this, to, to provide solution to these constraints. So uh, when we we see and when we say financing is the problem, I we really I have to to stop thinking that uh, financing sector is the problem. I think it's the, the way we see the financing, the way we set the target of the financing, which we have to to solve, uh, and and this project could I think provides one of the solution. Uh, thank you, uh, Quentin. Here on this, uh, our view is that actually there is no problem in financing. This whole green asset class, energy saving measures, 
which already the, our friends at McKinsey are calling as the low-hanging fruits in the in the conversion to a net zero uh, economy. Uh, it's, it, the, the, the funds are there. They are with the banks and they are at investment fund level. And I would fully agree uh, with Quinton that basically uh, the, the issue is on the contractual side. And this is why we have gone in the whole establishing of the contract for as a service, which apparently, according to various auditors we have uh, consulted, is structured in a completely off balance sheet way like these municipalities who are after all the largest uh, asset holders uh, in, in, in in Europe can uh, take these contracts can do the measures without unduly affecting uh, their own balance sheet and national debt but at the same time I'm thinking of uh, charities who are precluded from taking on debt uh, therefore, they cannot do retrofits like heating, cooling, uh, whatever they, they they need to do for the for uh, for their own buildings. So I think that the contract is a central piece, and I hope that we'll be able to share it by the end of September. Uh, thank you very much, Chaba and Quentin. Um, I finally have a couple questions uh, for Matthew. The first one being specifically as TNO is responsible for the piloting, how will we be actually gathering feedback in practice from different stakeholders that will be helping to pilot the launch materials? So if you can shed some light on that, that would be useful. Sure, thanks Caroline. Um, so we intend to combine a few different techniques. Um, so things like short surveys, bilateral interviews, and of course the workshops that we will be scheduling throughout the project. Um, however, we, will, we would really encourage those taking part in the pilot to con continuously give feedback at suitable times uh, as and when there's useful information to provide. So that really reflects the dynamic process of the piloting. Um, and this could be, of course, via email or short phone calls. Uh, and we think this, this approach means we'll have a really dynamic, iterative piloting program that's best suited for for testing the types of materials that we have uh, or that we are developing in launch. Thank you very much, Matthew. Uh, I think that's we're just about at the end of time. We have one final question and it comes well. Again, I um, wanted to give you all this one last slide to remind you to register for this event, which can be found on the launch website. Um, so the contractor workshop will be taking place in the morning and I had a question um, if we can to expand on the format and content of that contractor workshop specifically that will be taking place in November. Uh, Matthew, do you want to say a few words on that? Sure, no problem. Um, so yes, as, as you state, uh, Caroline, the workshop will precede the investors forum um, and we really see the workshop as one of the first main opportunities to gather feedback from project developers on two of the project's key outputs. Uh, one is the, the draft of the standardized contract and secondly the initial sales process material on customer decision mapping that we're currently developing. Um, and we intend to present these drafts and then facilitate breakout table discussions with smaller groups of project developers to uh, solicit feedback on aspects such as key challenges they typically face when devising contracts um, and in also in trying to, uh, to work towards closing a deal, um, the potential ease of use of these materials and their application in the marketplace uh, and so forth. So we think this collective feedback session will be a, a really nice springboard for starting the, the dynamic piloting phase uh, of launch. Excellent, thank you very much. Uh, one final question um, that I wanted to address. I had a, actually a couple questions came in about uh, whether the UK would be eligible to pilot with launch. Um, if any other partners have a, another point of view, please let, please join in. But on our side, we would say no initially that it should not, it should not, um, you should not be uh, cut out from being able to pilot. Um, we are looking the sustainable energy asset market is 
larger than just one country and finance does work across borders. Uh, it can be complicated, but um, there should be something for everyone. And for example, the sales process piece uh, also has nothing to do with direct project finance anyway. And I do believe that what we're doing should be able to support all companies. So we started this project, um, we applied for this project uh, you know, before Brexit, um, well, <laughs> in the midst of Brexit, but we're still in the midst of Brexit. And the UK is still at this moment officially a member of the EU. And so our intention from the beginning was companies uh, in the EU 28. So we will do our best to go forward as such, um, as a team. And with that in mind, I see we didn't have time to get to all of your questions, but we'll do our best to reach out to you bilaterally as much as possible. You will all receive the slides and a recording of the webinar uh, for your information. And if you feel like sharing with colleagues, please go ahead. Um, please do check out our Launch 2020 website um, and register for the event in Brussels. It should be a lot of fun. Um, if you want to pitch your company or your projects at the event in front of a panel of investors, please also do get in touch. There are many opportunities and uh, we want to do our best to make sure that everyone is aware of the opportunities and participates if it is uh, in their interest to do so. So thank you very much. I'll say another big thank you to all of the speakers today who did an excellent job and um, we look forward to being in touch with you all in the coming months. Thank you.